Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Federation Hall. I feel like it's been ages since I've seen you all. Um, I'm David Sequera, and I'm the director of the Fiona and Sidney Meyer Gallery. And I'm also the person that gets to program Art Forum, and it really is my joy to welcome you here today. And before I introduce Dan Arps, I do want to take a moment to invite you all to ground yourself in the deep knowledge that long before the University of Melbourne or the VCA was thought of, that the Bunurung and Wurundjeri people for generations uh, practiced song and dance here. They made paintings, they made sculptures, they shared stories, they practiced healing here. And it really is with great joy and honour that I acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. So our guest speaker, Dan Arps. Dan Arps installations, sculptures and paintings fuse architecture, public space and nomadic structures to expand and reflect upon modernist traditions of abstraction, alienation and the everyday. His work explores and responds to the environment of contemporary suburban Auckland. Dan gained a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Sculpture from the School of Fine Arts at the University of Canterbury uh, in Christchurch. He received a Master of Fine Arts from Elam School of Fine Arts, and then followed that with a PhD in 2014, both from, um, also from Elam. In 2010, he was awarded the Aotearoa New Zealand's Premier Contemporary Art Award, the Walters Prize, for his exhibition, Explaining Things. And Dan has exhibited extensively throughout uh, New Zealand and Australia, as well as taking part in multiple international projects. And his work's been included in Abject Failures at Hastings City Art Gallery, Space Suit at Dunedin Public Gallery, Necessary Distraction, a painting show at Auckland Art Gallery, and Local Knowledge, the Dow's Art Museum, and um, also the Sao Paulo Biennale. Please, wherever you are, in Zoom land or in Federation Hall, please make Dan Arps very, very welcome. Thanks, David, for that lovely introduction. Um, so, uh, one of the things I like to do is I like to um, uh, take found diagrams and use them as metaphors for the structures and um, I guess the thinking structures and physical structures that uh, I'm concerned with. So I thought I'd start today with a classic uh, Gary Gygax uh, Dungeons and Dragons uh, map from the original Dungeons and Dragons game. Uh, this is for, from a, a quest, The Search for the Unknown, um, which I think is a nice way of framing, framing what, I'm, what I do. Um, so this is kind of a, a map of of the territory that we're about to enter into. Um, more, more or less. And I thought that today I'd talk a little bit about the um, some of the projects that I've done that respond to uh, particular parts of uh, Auckland where I've been living for the last 20 years. Um, and uh, um, we're going to do it through looking at uh, documentation of like finished artworks. We could have a different talk about like researchy type things, but it's just going to be all finished finished stuff. And I want to start um, with this project from 2011. This is uh, an installation called Hobson Gardens. Um, Hobson Gardens is a site on um, Hobson Street in central Auckland. Uh, not too far from where this gallery was um, uh, in central Auckland. Um, Hobson Gardens is an apartment building that um, had a kind of, I got really fascinated with its car park entrance. It had a sign uh, in um, uh, white with black text in Helvetica all caps. It said Hobson Gardens and then it had a big kind of caged garage door front and a lot of concrete. So it's sort of a, uh, a kind of like a, 
pretty expanded sense of what a what a garden might be. <laughs> um, and uh, um, this gallery, um, this is the Michael Lett Gallery uh, space that um, uh, it's moved a couple of times since then, but this is uh, in uh, Great North Road and the gallery was actually a uh, converted um, car park for like a rep repco or something like that. Uh, so I wanted to make some works that kind of caught the essence of it, but I'm very interested in the ways that uh, a space might be like compressed or compacted. Um, so I guess the, um, uh, what I think would end up happening would be that I'd end up making like an abstract painting that has a relationship to the space. Um, so there's this, this one here, this is called a weak idea grid study from Hobson Gardens. And it's a um, kind of a steel construction, steel and wood and acrylic paint and epoxy glue. Um, there's a found uh, kind of printed vinyl stuck to the wall behind it. And um, the, the, the space has been treated with this, um, it looks like a spray paint, but it's actually um, like hair dye in a spray can, um, which uh, I had found it a $2 shop and I thought it was interesting that you could buy it when you're like under 16 or something and it was like a kind of a dodgy uh, like workaround for spray paint. Um, and it's just kind of painted by um, squirting the can and walking around the space, kind of like a high tide mark. And uh, there's also in the space this kind of um, series of diagrams. This is a, a found diagram. Um, uh, this is uh, Julianne Klizik, and she's, I think she's some kind of like post-Freudian psychoanalyst, and she's very interested in this kettle-shaped graph. Uh, as I understand it, it's like um, kind of talking about how the things in the middle are very closely related on the left and the right, and then the things at the extremes are very closely related. So kind of like a, a version of like horseshoe theory or, or something like that. And the overall kind of space is like a, is kind of, it's like sort of super minimal, but uh, like evocative of, um, I don't know, like the urban environment. This is kind of like, quasi uh, figurative sculpture here that has um, all sorts of disgusting uh, glue and stuff all over it. And um, you can't see in this um, picture, but if you were to go onto the other side, you'd see that it was wearing a Mickey Mouse sweatshirt. Um, soon after this, I did another project. This is, um, uh, local a show a group show called Local Knowledge um, at the Douse, and uh, at this point I'd just been traveling around quite a lot. Uh, in 2011, I was lucky enough to come across the Occupy New York protest, and I spent a few days like documenting details from that. Um, but then also the remit of the show was to kind of consider the, you know, the relationship between the local and the global. And um, uh, I was really interested in, in, in the Douse in Wellington. It's like um, Lower Hutt. It's a kind of a old industrial area. And um, when I was kind of researching the show, uh, we were finding a lot of kind of old stuff that was actually made in the area. And then I was kind of interested in the history of kind of like stuff being made and then the current situation where it's all like shopping malls and stuff that's imported and nothing is made here. Um, so I kind of combined this idea of um, 
the form of the protest. So the kind of a lovely uh, flat screen TV in the shopping cart there, you know, it's sort of like looting or something. Um, there's, uh, there's protest signs and things that uh, relate to um, nothing in particular. Um, but uh, the big structures, um, this uh, caravan, which was made, it's like a, a Ministry of Works caravan that was made in the um, Lower Hutt Rail Yards. And the blankets that were, they're actually, um, they have the Patoni label, so just out of Lower Hutt, things like that. And then the whole space is like, um, I don't know, it's like kind of an occupation or uh, something that's not really for display in the gallery. It's more like a, um, like a space to be in, inhabited or something. Um, we can kind of see these two kind of multiple spaces and then there's another another space on the other side that has some 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 more uh, bits bits pieces but I really want to get a kind of sense of I don't know like kind of the histories colliding in the space and uh, also it being like a very um, uh, transformative kind of an installation where you're not quite sure where you are anymore. Um, so this project, this project uh, is a couple of years um, later. This is from 2013 and it's actually called After Hobson Gardens and I actually returned to the site, the Hobson Gardens site um, and, and kept looking at it because it had gone from being something that was just like a little bit derelict looking to being some kind of full-blown disaster area. Um, what had happened in the meantime is that, and it's kind of very emblematic of Auckland's real estate development cycle, was that the building, which I think was built in the 90s, had started to leak. There's a real big thing about leaky buildings and poor construction in, um, uh, in Auckland in particular in the 90s. And then, uh, so the whole, building had been emptied out and kind of stripped of its cladding and um, it had these uh, enormous cranes uh, built up the side and then um, uh, the construction company that was doing the refit went broke and um, had to just like stay there. Um, stay there like that. Um, uh, as a derelict site for actually for a couple of years. Um, so I kind of went back and I started trying to uh, copy some of the like apartment architecture to make these kind of larger scale sculptures that are kind of also, um, I don't know, they like echo the materiality and the, um, uh, the kind of formalism of the, these kind of, uh, of these apartments. Uh, detail. And um, I kind of like these works and that they're like, uh, they're quite minimal. And then there's like little details like Hello Kitty stickers or like um, little stars on the windows. So it's kind of like touches of the human and, um, but overall it's very austere. Um, here's another detail. You can see a uh, very windblown looking leaf kind of over in the corner there. <laughs> okay, so this is this is uh, the next project that uh, the next sort of major project that I did after that. Um, this is an installation at the Auckland Art Gallery, uh, part of a show called Freedom Farmers, and the installation is called. Uh, museum apartment prison daycare and um, 
it was kind of I think part of it is thinking about like what the museum is for, like um, the art gallery and there had been a kind of a like a shift in the in the way art galleries have been used in the last little bit. Like um, I kind of thought it would be interesting um, to make work that's like designed to have the selfie taken in, in front of it, like rather than necessarily being like a um, I don't know like a thing that you look at. It's like a thing that you interact with in a different kind of a way. Um, but it's also about um, early childhood education in, in um, New Zealand had kind of changed over the last few years and I wanted to um, make work that kind of started to comment on that. Um, I think a lot of a lot of what my work is really trying to do is to think about the ways that um, environment and like media and stuff influence the people that we become. And um, at this time, uh, the government introduced like 20 free hours of early childhood education to these like privatized providers and the, um, the They were kind of, they're kind of like um, very kind of corporate and I don't know, like everywhere, very ubiquitous, kind of like houses converted and then um, uh, into, into daycares. And they would have all these kind of like brightly colored murals. And then they have like the streaming, screaming kids that were being looked after very nicely. Um, and I was also kind of interested in, um, the kind of somewhat apocryphal stories of um, like uh, Disney suing a daycare over painting pictures of Mickey Mouse or whatever in the on the walls of the of the daycare. Um, so it had this kind of um, had this kind of uh, like slightly confused kind of conflation of all these things. Um, and it was sort of, um, I don't know, like I think that the, there's something kind of really dystopian about the, about the, um, the daycare situations. Um, and uh, I kind of really wanted to capture that in the, in the museum space and use it as something that you could like take a selfie in front of. Sort of like, um, I don't know, it's almost like satirical or something. And uh, these uh, uh, small apartment type things got used again for that. Um, you can see um, this wall treatment um, in the back, which is based on, um, it's copied from uh, my son's primary school decor. And then the other images are taken from uh, like coloring in pages that I found on the internet, things like that. And uh, I think it's quite a, like a fun way of making a show with the murals and always good to get out of the white wall, you know, change the, change the setting. Um, this work is a, um, a kind of a combination of two things. Um, one, uh, there was a guy who I used to see um, at the local supermarket all the time that had a rubbish bin strapped to a pram that he used as a, um, like a shopping cart. So I kind of made my own version of it. And the other, the other thing that this is conjoined with is um, uh, my old uh, artist run space that I used to be involved in. Uh, we let the registration of the URL lapse and then the site got taken over by uh, Gambia Castle's daily wellness blogs. Uh, so this is like a print out of that web page kind of draped over it, sort of like a cyber squatting uh, local supermarket um, shopping kind of uh, 
object sort of doesn't really make sense, but it kind of made sense to me. Um, uh, this is uh, this is uh, kind of around about the same time. Um, this is like my more uh, like um, commercial gallery operation type thing, and kind of simultaneous with uh, doing these kind of bigger architectural projects, I've been developing um, uh, a system for casting paintings, and um, I was quite interested in the idea that. Um, I'd been using ready-mades for a lot for a long time, and I had a real problem with like the idea of like selling a ready-made work because then you wouldn't have it anymore. It would be like um, sometimes these things would be very unique and hard to replace. So I was sort of got into casting from that, and then somehow I got into the idea of um, casting paintings. Um, and they have a sort of a uh, I sort of see them as being like somewhere between kind of outsider art and, um, but they're also quite um, heavily influenced by the kind of monochrome painting tradition. Um, here's a couple of details of these. Um, this is a work called Schreber Monument. Um, the Schreber refers to, um, uh, Daniel Paul Schreiber, the, the judge who um, Sigmund Freud used as a, um, as a, like the kind of prototypical model of the psychopath or schizophrenic. I think um, I had found his book, uh, Memoirs of My Nervous Illness, in which case, uh, where he sort of talks about um, his kind of, uh, like he describes his hallucinations in quite a lot of depth and talks about how God is the sun and the sun sends his angels, which are the rays of the sun, to talk to him. And I was quite interested in that in that um, idea. And also there's a little moment in, I think it's in the Thousand Plateaus, where they make an off, off sort of like a comment saying that um, Shreve thought the sun shined out of his ass. So there's this kind of solar anus um, conjunction within this within this work. It's sort of um, uh, kind of sort of profound, but also kind of scatological and um, uh, um, there's something about the the kind of the composition of it that. Um, uh, just sort of, sort of, I don't know, the, the ray the ray of the sun seems like a really strong uh, compositional move for me. And it's something that has stuck with me. I think it's something about the sun being the god or the life force. Um, so that's that. And then uh, we're jumping forward uh, a couple of years later to this, um, uh, this show, this is a show called Tinnitus Miracle, and um, uh, that that um, title comes from a spam email that I received. Um, uh, I was quite interested in spam, like uh, spam. Uh, spam is something that is like unsolicited and someone's trying to send it to you and trying to hook you into something like they want to sell you something they want to um and they're quite desperate about it so they want to try and identify your weaknesses and your neuroses and i feel like a lot of things in the world are like that <laughs> um so i was trying to um i don't know uh like Kind of, I guess try to think about how to deal with spam. And one of the things I ended up doing was I made this uh, spam dungeon, which is not super clear in this image, but um, instead of the uh, instead of the uh, classic dungeon mapping smithies and uh, uh, you know dungeons and whatnot. Uh, this has tinnitus miracle and cures for baldness and cures for erectile dysfunction uh, on at each node. So it's kind of like a, a 
it's a dungeon of spam just like maybe you're trying to escape from it or maybe uh it's just there wherever you go and you can't escape um and it's paired here with um these uh paintings that i was doing which i think were really just about trying to like loosen up and um be a little bit expressive um Here we go. here's an installation view uh, for this show i was um i really wanted to get away from the white wall again and i've been making these uh paintings on printed canvas so like the dots the dots on the canvas sort of, uh, pointed into it as a manufactured product and i think on the other one it also has uh, some kind of dots or something under, underneath there and they kind of uh uh, this one on the on the left that's called educational field and again it's based on um, uh, the way they make borders and frames and I think I think I, I think again it's to do with subject formation and I think the the concern for the frame is about the way that subjects are framed or contained or um, kind of um, corralled. Um, and then on the um, on the right here, there is a stroller that is um, I don't know. It sort of works as a kind of an uncanny figurative sculpture. Um, you know, like people would come to the gallery and they'd be like, like they have to be like really quiet because they think they're going to wake the baby, or um, uh, they're like, oh, did you know? Did you know that someone's left their baby in the? in the gallery like things like that I, I quite like that like moment of confusion or um uh uncertainty about it and also um something very strong about the the gray uh paint on the wall and the gray paint on the sleeping bag and um the kind of space that they make between them here's a um here's a a close-up of that This is uh, the next show in my uh, chronology of shows I've got here. This is a show called uh, Nested Cells. And the, the title comes from um, uh, Microsoft Excel. Um, you know, the cell of the, um, the, cell of the uh, spreadsheet. If you put another cell inside, that's a nested cell. And um, again, I'm trying to kind of, I don't know, like deal with the, the you know, this gallery is just way too uh, nice for my text. And so I'm trying to like use the paint on the wall to kind of reclaim it and to make it uh, my own, somehow make my own space. Um, and there's some more of these kind of abstract kind of you know like almost abstract expressionist paintings but again they're painted on uh patterned um uh fabric that's usually used for like kids uh curtains and stuff here's another view uh and then uh in this show also is this uh, uh large uh cast painting called sleep um which has kind of got the the sunflower uh, sort of motif and it's like a little bit cubist and I was having trouble with these um, the formlessness of these works at this point and they'd just gotten so really enormously large um, uh, I kind of was almost kind of like it's about kind of losing yourself in the space of the work you kind of they kind of envelop you when you're up close to them What's a kind of uh, kind of um, roughly worked clay surfaces? Um, uh, this is a detail of one of the small paintings from that show. Um, this is like um, like a Colin McCann riff, or maybe it's a Michaela Dwyer riff. It's like a little bit of a little bit of both. Um, 
Uh, this is a work called Wheeled Assemb Assemblage. It's from the show, what was the show? Um, a show called Overproof Recombinance at Robert Heal, which uh, um, the initial idea was to um, use these cast works that are kind of like, uh, like uh, made too many of them, you know, for like commercial purposes and to like recombine them with other cast elements. But I also had this um, thing in my studio, the uh, wheeled assemblage. Um, this is uh, some kind of studio detritus um, uh, on a makeshift table that's made out of a wheelie chair. And then another work is um, kind of a bunch of, I don't know, like kind of wire netting and stuff that makes the pram into this kind of larger and slightly more ominous kind of kind of thing. It has like a wider range of kind of surfaces and treatments in it. Here's composition three. You can see this kind of um, really kind of formless biomorphic um, uh, blobby thing going on. I think I was really, really losing it <laughs> with these works. Uh, here's the installation view. This is a this is an image of uh, of my work from a two person show. The show is just called Dan Ups and Fiona Clark. Uh, Fiona Clark is a photographer based in um, Taranaki in New Plymouth in um, the North Island of New Zealand, and she's very famous for her documentation of the, um, like the transvestite scene and the gay club scene in the early, late sort of mid seventies in Auckland. Um, and she's presented this this uh, collection of work. Um, I think this is the all these photos are taken at Mr Universe Sydney in nineteen eighty. And um, there's some really nice photos of Arnold Schwarzenegger all oiled up um, and very sort of muscly people. And uh, the, my sculptures are really just, I guess they're like a collection of things that were in the studio already. Um, the studio is a big mess and uh, things get very, very edited when they get sh shown. So a lot of the stuff had never been seen before, but um, it had been in the studio for years and years. Uh, so I kind of um, had spent my kind of lead-in time to the to the show making making bases and trying to make uh, the perfect base for every sculpture by making a base and then making another base and then making another base until the sculpture was right. Uh, here's some details of the sculptures. This is a work, I think uh, it's cast of a sculpture from uh, really early on, like 2007 or, or so. And uh, it's called Motherhood or something like that. And there's a, a baby bird and a mum of bird. And they have this kind of, uh, I've made this kind of nest form that they sit in. Studio detritus, weird studio plump, um, little bronze guy. Um, that's come out of uh, collaborating with my kids. Um, I think that's a that's like my son uh, making a sculpture of my dad or something like that. And also this this work, which um, had come about from uh, me trying to make a bigger version of uh, my son's little figurative sculpture, um, uh, which is sort of, I don't know, it's like somehow it accidentally turned into a cause or something like that. Um, a work called Dry Orosporos that was related to um, the Relic show a few years earlier. 
and this uh, painting uh, constellation uh, from 2018. It's sort of in another space. You can't see it in that, in, but it's from this show. And it also made a bronze of Schreiber monument, which really brings out the um, chocolatey, pooey um, quality of the composition and um, kind of hermetically um, kind of makes it into an all over kind of a color scheme. All right, and then, so I, I said that I've gotten really, um, was so, so starting to lose it with the cast paintings and that they were too formless for me and that I didn't really know what they were doing. So in an attempt to kind of change, change it around a little bit, I started making these kind of fence forms and uh, they relate to uh, the suburb where I live now in Auckland, uh, Mount Roskill, which has, um, it's kind of, I don't know, I don't know if there's the same sort of thing in Australia, but in New Zealand, there's a lot of state housing areas where you get the house, but you get no fence. And then any kind of fencing is something that the residents have done. So they're kind of like the personality of the house or like the face of the house. And um, in Mount Roskill, they're very tall and it's quite ominous. They're very kind of tall and dark brown and um, uh, everywhere, everywhere has this kind of same kind of thing. So I um, started making these little kind of abstract paintings based on the fence forms. These ones are made in wood. And I, uh, I was kind of interested in, um, you know, the that kind of idea of the fenced area versus the open expanse. So uh, I'd have this um, uh, this little diorama, which uh, is kind of like I was kind of thinking it's like camping or maybe like Burning Man or something. It's like the desert, and there's a little tent and like a little, little rubbish bag. It's kind of like the openness and the um, I don't know, the kind of wastefulness of like you want to get into nature, but you bring your baggage with you or whatever. You can't kind of quite ever go back to nature. Um, and that dichotomy between the containedness and the spaciousness. Um, so this kind of idea got expanded on a little bit in this, uh, this work. Uh, this is an installation at my public gallery from 2021. I'm getting to the end of my slides now. Uh, this is the floral maze. Um, and um, these works are kind of based on these fence forms and they're kind of com combined with the um, cast paintings. Uh, but they're like uh, cast in, like uh, I'd make a smaller form and then repeat, repeat the motif. And so the work would be like a combination of multiples of the same thing. Um, so this one's a nice kind of orange monochrome called Equivalent. Yeah, I was kind of interested in the, um, I don't know, like the compositional, um, there's something like very harmonious about squares. And I was very interested in how this work kind of made a nice square with its four um, elements. And they're kind of like, I think, uh, I was always very, uh, I was always very um, worried about repeating myself. And I always wanted to be doing something new. And I think with these works, I get to take that fear about repeating myself and, um, kind of face it head on and deal with repetition as a theme. Um, here's another view. And uh, so for the next show, I'll just run through this really quickly. This is the last thing I'm gonna show. I started thinking about how the fences were um, starting to become like a narrative device. And um, besides being able to, um, like see like little details on people's fences. Like I noticed that some people were like nailing bottle tops to their fence or they put some little thing that 
means they can see um, their house from the car when they're driving home at night, those kinds of things. Um, I got kind of interested in how it um, also is like a setting. It's like a setting for a narrative. And um, I wanted to um, make a, like a narrative that will sit in the suburbs. And um, so I kind of made this thing that's kind of like a little tiny little drawing more than, more than anything kind of big, but it's uh, based on, there's a short story, like a kid's novel by Margaret Mahi called Raging Robots and Unruly Uncles. And it's like a family drama um, kind of thing where there's two families, like a rich family and a poor family. And they both have robots. Like the rich family have this kind of beautiful um, girl robot that wears a maid's uniform. And then the uh, the poor family has this robot that they make out of tin cans and bits of wire. And um, uh, he's called Nasher. He's a frying pan for a face. And he's like a murderous psychopath. And the story sort of largely revolves around um, Nasher going crazy. So this is like my little 3D uh, printed model of Nasher that I made out of bits of things that I found on the internet and 3D design software. And he's um, currently kind of crawled out of the rubbish bin. He's like reanimated, angry, psychopathic rubbish. Uh, but it's set in the suburbs, and I, I guess is the point. And um, uh, it gives the fences like a different kind of a reading. So I might, I might just kind of, that's, that's my last slide. Um, I might just leave it there and I'll open for questions or if anyone has any. Thanks so much, Dan. And we do have some time for some questions. So if there's anybody um, in our audience who'd like to ask Dan a question, please just let us know. And Yeah, please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. Can I get you to come by? Uh, yeah. Um, how do I structure it? I just. At the moment, because I've been doing these um, repetitious pieces, like I can make like two elements a day if I really work hard. And um, I think it's, I think it's really become a balance of things that are quite mechanical. Like, so I can go to the studio and I can work for a certain amount of time and I can always have an outcome, but it's also like quite easy to do and doesn't take much thinking so I think it's about having that balance of kind of mechanical easy things to do and then considering the what to do with the, the things that you make and also there's a, a kind of a repository of sculptural forms and um, kind of tables and um, molds and all that kind of stuff um, I don't know if that, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Related to the studio practice, I'm just a bit curious about the actual process, what it's like, is there like a particular framework or like using framework or like using kind of framework and multiple things? Oh, um, what, but what's, what it started from was in the early days, I was making, um, like paintings that had like putty frames and the first works were actually like passed from the putty frames and then after that they've kind of developed into um like the, it's just like a process like one one work can be turned into the next work and kind of like chip away the bits you don't want and um uh 
you know, like with a plaster or, or something like that. And uh, there's also certain works we get made um, just like on the floor out of clay. And um, sometimes there's kind of like a, quite a construction for that. So that, you know, like with the big ones, the, um, there's like a, uh, like a wooden structure and then there's like plaster and then there's plasticine that's like really involved, big, big long process. Well, we've got time for both yeah. of them, so yeah. please. Do you want to go first? Yeah, I was just curious to know what your um, actual study is on. Uh, yeah, um, that's that's on like academia. You can um, you can go and get it. Um, but the title was Fragments: The Apocalyptic Everyday, and it was really about that sense of foreboding that you get. Um, you know, like at 4 a.m. in the morning and like things are a bit chaotic or um, uh, when the events of the world pile up and it feels like the world is going to end imminently. And also I was quite interested in um, uh, this idea of how that is really tied to the everyday and to the normal. Like there's like, um, it's like uh, portent, portending the end or something. And I was also really interested in um, Boris Groys and his uh, take that um, uh, like, uh, I mean, he really uses um, things like Malevich as an example of something that's kind of quite like, um, I guess the good art has an apocalyptic tone to it. I guess is, is what I'm getting at. Uh, yeah. And um, the other thing that I think is, is in the in the DocuBay document um, that you don't see here is a lot of research images and um, photography and like kind of travel photography and stuff from the looking at the city and things like that. And Tessa? Um, yeah, well, um, the dark and the apocalyptic topic was one that's interesting, and I like the way you ended with the, um, what were you saying, the psychotic, reanimated, angry, um, degrees or robots? Yeah. 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 So, kind of reanimated, angry robots, which I thought was kind of a good. I think they just feel alive, you know. I think um, they have a they have an energy to them. I think I like things that have an energy to them, and I think what the fence works. I like what you're saying about that relationship between the the formalism and the politics, because I think that's what these works are kind of um, starting to integrate much more. Um, the way that the fence is used to like divide up land and to stake claims of ownership and to um, uh, like, you know, as part of the capitalist apparatus. And I think that these works are kind of 
trying to, I don't know if they really do, but they're trying to like comment on that or draw those dialogues into the work. Um, yeah, but I think also, I don't know, I think my interest in formalism is really also kind of quite tied to, you know, having been at art school and having to um, kind of, I don't know, like there's a formalism to, um, like in the University of Canterbury, especially, there's kind of like a really big emphasis on site specificity and making work that is for a particular place. And um, I, that's never left me, I don't think, that, that emphasis. Uh, I think it's, uh, I think it's like maybe like quite a good thing in some ways. Well, thanks so much, yeah. Dan, for taking us through those last few yeah. years. And, yeah, thanks um, for inviting me. Oh, my absolute pleasure. Um, just some a few um, notes. Uh, Dan's show opens at Neon Park Gallery on Friday night. Um, so it's the Brunswick, the Brunswick Neon Park. So uh, Jeff asked me to extend a very warm welcome to everybody to that opening. Um, also, um, this is the second last week of Art Forum for the semester. So next week is Jason Fu. That will be the last session. And then a reminder to everybody that at 5 p.m. we have the opening of Bodies at the Fiona and Sydney Meyer Gallery, which is um, a selection of paintings from the VCA Historic Collection. And um, tonight, I've, I've forgotten how many performances there are, June, but a, a lot. Um, but you'd be very, very welcome to, to come and join in um, to see those performances and have a drink and, and celebrate our last exhibition for the year with us. So thanks very much. <laughs>